Uh, you can go, Bill. Wonderful. Well, uh, well good morning, everyone. Um, it, uh, it's, it's great to be involved um, in your boot camp uh, this year for 2022. Um, I was involved in uh, 2020, and uh, and it's really great to be back. I think um, this uh, this is a really exciting project that you're looking at, um, something that is close to me as an architect that works in the cultural sector. And um, when we think about uh, sustainability and resilience, et cetera, I think it's a, a really interesting project. Um, as far as uh, today is concerned, I'm going to talk about um, collaborating in a complex world and, and uh, environment that uh, is the construction industry and specifically about a construction methodology called integrated project delivery. Um, I've got quite a few slides to go through. Um, it's gonna be a bit of drinking from the fire hose. So, uh, so please uh, <laughs> stay tuned and see what happens. But we've got about 116 slides to get through in 45 minutes, which is uh, gonna be a lot of fun. Um, but I am gonna spend some time talking to you about a bit about our firm because I think it's important to put the context, put in place the context for how we collaborate and why we think integrated project delivery is important. So, as far as our practice is concerned, Lead Architects is an architectural design practice. Um, we're known across the province um, as being innovative. We've uh, we've really worked hard to develop best in class expertise. Um, we service the public and not for profit sectors predominantly. Um, so most of our clients are government or not for profit organizations. Um, our value proposition um, is in the broader lens of corporate citizenship. Um, we want to balance purpose and profit. Uh, we consider the impact of our decisions um, on our clients, our team, um, and most importantly, the communities um, in which we work and how it affects the environment. So um, we are part of a group of companies that are driving a global movement of people using business as a force for good. We want to be part of a solution. Um, we want to uh, challenge the conventional ways of thinking, which is really what uh, today is about, and finding better means to a better outcome. Um, so um, what does that mean? It means that um, we uh, were one of the first, and we are currently the highest ranked certified B Corporation in Canada. Um, uh, four months ago, I was able to say that we were the only um, certified B Corporation architecture firm in Canada. Um, what that is, it's for-profit companies that meet the highest verified standards, standards of social transparency and accountability. So we were audited. It took a two, it was a two-year process um, to go through this. There are over 4,500 B Corporations in 150 industries in 74 countries with one goal, and that's to redefine the success in business. Um, our community is uh, working towards reducing inequality lower levels of poverty, healthier environment, strong communities, and the creation of high quality jobs, <coughs> pardon me, dignity and purpose. Lead Architects are also members of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Um, we're here to help promote, strengthen, and enhance prosperous Indigenous, a prosperous Indigenous economy. Um, we take that really seriously. All of our projects um, are, are on Indigenous land, and we have a duty to consult. And so we're, we're learning right now um, what that means and best practices as we um, build um, infrastructure in the communities that we live and work. Um, much of the contents that you're going to see today and the process that we, we use in integrated project delivery comes from the Integrated Project Delivery Alliance. We are uh, members of the alliance. Um, it's a, an alliance of like-minded companies that have come together to focus um, on improving outcomes across Canada. Uh, and um, I've sat on the board of this organization now for five years. I've lectured across Canada in every major city. Um, to try and enhance how we design and build buildings. Um, I'm really excited to say that we are one of 250 businesses that are a member of the Green Economy Canada, and um, we're um, you know, taking, uh, taking our role in this seriously. So we have done all of the carbon accounting for our business, and um, I'm happy to say that we can say that Lead Architects um, has put their best foot forward and we are a zero carbon business. 
And um, lastly, uh, um, we uh, were co-authors uh, with 26 other um, companies across the country to what's called the Guide to Social Procurement and Construction and Infrastructure Projects, looking at how we can, we can bring social procurement into the construction industry. As an example, one of our projects that we're currently doing is the Canadian Canoe Museum. It's a national museum. And that project, um, we are working with a local organization in the community to bring homeless to the job site and train them to be laborers. And that's just one small aspect of social procurement. Uh, the guide is available off of Buy Social Canada's website. I highly recommend downloading it. Um, there's a lot of great content. As far as an organization, our values um, revolve around culture, people, and integrity. And we call this Design for the Human Spirit. So why am I telling you all of this? Um, it, uh, I think it's important when you look at the context of the project that you're looking at. The St. Lawrence Center for the Performing Arts um, has uh, been an, uh, an important part of Toronto cult Toronto's cultural heritage fabric. Um, but as they start to think about what's next, um, it's fantastic to see how, um, how there has been uh, so much thought and process and consultation um, to, to think about what this project could be. Um, so these are some of the points uh, from, uh, from the uh, St. Lawrence Centre next um, documentation. Um, they're looking at ensuring dynamic and highly flexible spaces, built for extreme usability, creating a bold and open building that fits the neighbourhood, and be future facing for a decarbonized world. So it's pretty easy to, to gloss over these, but each of these points has so many subheadings and so many thoughts around it. And I really think that um, how we think about design and how this building is built can feed into these. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So really the goals of that, of this project and what will be a future design competition this fall um, align with our goals as a business. And um, the uh, project presents an opportunity to design and build better too. So in my mind, um, we really have a set of contractual tools in the construction industry um, that we can go to, to create a highly collaborative environment. And the best tool is a contractual tool and a tool that that speaks to the culture of a project and that's called integrated project delivery. Ultimately, we have to change how we approach design and construction. We cannot do business as usual and we know the facts. There's history on this. Um, so here is, uh, here's a chart that uh, only unfortunately goes to 2012, um, but it's a, it's a chart that shows productivity um, showing the manufacturing industry as compared to the construction industry. Construction industry being at the bottom, manufacturer being at the top. The construction industry has actually lost productivity since, um, since the 90s. And um, there's just, there's, there's so much to be said here and we could, we could take hours just to review why that is. But basically construction has become more and more complex. Systems have become more and more complex. More and more is going into buildings. Um, there are uh, labor agreements, union agreements, et cetera, that feed into this as well. And um, we just need to, to build better. The other aspect of this is what's happening on our job sites. Um, we have enormous waste um, that uh, you can see here um, that, is, uh, that is happening in the construction industry as opposed to the manufacturing industry. The other thing that is consistent in our industry is that um, the majority of projects or much of the projects um, are either uh, behind schedule or over budget. The traditional models of designing a building, tendering the drawings, um, hiring a contractor, building the building in what we call a stipulated sum model is just not working. Um, we also know that buildings um, use 48% of the energy, at least in the United States. Um, and Canada would be similar, if not greater, um, uh, given, given our climate. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's significant. So we have a responsibility on, on that side as well. 
So let's let's look at the traditional model um, that we've been we've been utilizing for decades and decades. We have an owner um, that uh, that then enters into an agreement on the left um, with an architect to design a building. We then have the owner um, uh, who enters into a contract with a, a contractor, a general contractor on the right. And then both of those contracts between the owner and the architect and the owner and the contractor have some loose terminology about how the architect and the contractor work together. Ultimately, this is this is how it how it how it unfolds. Um, it becomes confrontational, and um, it becomes about making sure that the the contractual boundaries are um, uh, are, are recognized and understood. So, how can we do this better? What are the ideas that we can do? What what is integrated project delivery? Well, let's look at that original. Um, contractual model in a different way. Say this is the landscape of any traditional project. We all know how it works. We carve the landscape up into territories or fiefdoms using contractual boundaries, with each single entity responsible for their area of the project. I'm sorry. Um, uh, um, so, uh, let me um, so, yeah, pardon me, with each single entity responsible for their area of the project. Um, I'm not interested in what happens on the other side of the landscape. My contract incentivizes me to do what's best for me within my part of the world. In the IPD world, things are different. We all still have our same roles and responsibilities, um, but we draw a single contractual boundary around the entire perimeter of the project. This drives an entirely different set of behaviors. Now I do care about what's going on with the others because there are boundaries between us. What you can do, what, what you do has real impact on my work. And since we're all um, contracted to deliver the project, I wanna know what's going on because we're going to succeed or fail together. This gives us a much stronger sense of connection and joint purpose. Um, integrated project delivery sets up a very different dynamic for communications and decision making. Instead of the usual carved up world with lots of contractual barriers where I write my question down, I send it up the chain across the wall and it goes down the other side to the person who might be able to answer it. And then they send their answer back up the chain across the wall and down back to me. In other words, in IPD, I can just simply lift my head and ask the person who has the answer in real time. This is huge in terms of reducing latency and improving understanding and decision making. So this single contractual boundary makes IPD different from traditional models in a few different ways. It gives us a stronger sense of being connected to a team, a stronger sense of common purpose, and a much improved framework for communication and decision making. Um, some of you um, in school may have heard of the McClamey curve. Um, McClamey was a, was a CEO of um, HOK Architects, one of the world's largest um, firms, and, and back in the uh, 70s um, came up with this chart where basically you can see that um, the ability to impact a project is, is better at the start of a project and um, uh, the cost of design changes increases as a project moves on. And traditionally, we've always thought of the preliminary design um, as say 25% of the work of a project, the construction documentation, the documents that the building's actually built from um, as 50%. So that purple piece in the typical effort that's peaking there, and then construction is the last 25%. Um, there's clear research that, um, that if you push um, a lot of the grunt work earlier into the project with early informed decisions, there's better impact that can be made to a project. Um, so ultimately, it's, um, it's, we go back to, to this model and what integrate, integrated project delivery does is, is it changes um, the contractual boundaries. So here we have a poly party agreement where everybody enters into the agreement together. And what's most important is the cultural piece of it. 
that the goals of the project and the values of the project drive the project. Hold on, what, what is this? Not, uh, I'm not sure what this is, but I'll leave it on the screen for a few seconds. So what are the principles of it? All of the participants are bound together as equals. Every member of the team is considered equal. Um, their shared financial risk and reward based on the outcome. So in integrated project delivery, we put our profit at risk. Um, liability waivers between key participants. Um, what that means is that um, we uh, basically say that we're not gonna sue each other. Uh, that there's financial transparency, so everybody can see each other's books. Early involvement of the key participants. The design is intensified. Um, all of the project criteria is developed as a group, and we make decisions collaboratively. Those are the contractual principles. The hope is that contractually we, we, we get the con contract set, and then we put it on the shelf and we don't look at it again. What's more important are the behavioral principles. So we want to make sure that there's mutual respect and trust, a willingness to collaborate, and open communication. So what are the catalysts? The catalysts are the multi-party agreement, so the contract is, is critical. Um, but the other two are more interesting. So we have to use building information modeling um, extensively in IPD. That's important to have the technology driving the project. Um, and then we use lean design and construction, and I'll get into that a little bit as well. So the result is we take um, a traditional approach here and we have, first we have the what. So what is the project? We go through schematic design and design development. And then finally we know the how. And then once we've, uh, we've tendered the project, we understand the who is going to do the project. In IPD, all of this is condensed. The what, um, the how, and the who all happen together at the start of the project because we come together to work collaboratively. IPD is about understanding the ramifications of design decisions and at the time the decisions are made. So it's great that we can say as architects, um, we're thinking of this high performing building envelope on this building um, uh, contractor. What do you think of this? What are your thoughts? Do you think that there's any um, uh, issues that we need to be thinking about as far as lead times are concerned, et cetera? Should we be considering something like prefabrication. So um, if we think about something like a cross laminated mass timber construction, um, one of the things that we've done in the past is all of the panels came to site with um, the exterior insulation and envelope um, ready to install. And that was a decision that was made early in the early stages because we had the contractor and we had the sub trades at the table. So it's really about rethinking the deliverables and, and that's asking the question of what does done look like? Um, it's a very different thing than in a traditional model. Um, in, in some cases, a napkin sketch uh, can be enough uh, of a deliverable to get one of the trade partners on the project going with an idea. Um, so the information, answers, and decisions are all rethunk in, in an IPD project. It's critical that we make everything visual, explicit, and transparent. And so it's important that we also take a, a closer look at the numbers. So how does this work? What am I talking about when I say that we put our profit at risk and how does that drive value into a project? The first important number is the owner's budget. On day one, the owner comes into the room and puts a number on the table. Um, it represents everything they have for the project all in based on their business case. So this number is sometimes known as the allowable cost. The team then moves through some pre-validation work, focuses on testing the owner's budget and business case, what's in, what's not, where did the numbers come from? Uh, when the numbers, uh, when were the numbers arrived at? What were the assumptions? Um, what's the business case on which they're based? Um, this is the team's opportunity to discover if a project is over budget, on target, or underfunded. 
Um, at the end of that testing, the team, including the owner, because the owner is a member of the team, sets a number that we call expected costs. This represents the team's um, opinion of what the market cost of the project would be um, if their current understanding of the project was built in the current market under a traditional delivery model. We then work through what we call validation, um, driving value and innovation in and waste out. And somewhere towards the end of validation, we commit as a team. And we establish a number called the base target cost. This is the end of validation and the team issues a validation report, which summarizes our collective commitment that we can build this building that does these things for this much money in this much time. And um, this is called base target cost. The team executes the IPD contract and then commits to delivering for that amount. Uh, the team moves forward into the design and procurement phase. Um, if the outcomes warrant, a fi final target cost is set at the end of this phase, uh, usually resulting only in adjustments um, to the risk pool um, or contingency, which then um, can bring savings back to the owner as well. Um, and at the end of the project, having tracked all expected costs and actual costs across the entire project, we have our final actual cost, um, the number on which any adjustments um, to the profit that we have at risk are made. And um, the owner has the opportunity to, 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 to take some of that cost back and the team shares in that um, as well as increased profit. So this process in IPD is called, called target value design. And the heavy lift for target value or design or TVD is during the design and procurement phase, similar to what we saw um, in the McClaney curve. So target value design is about uh, designing to a detailed estimate versus estimating to a detailed design. So what does that mean? Traditionally, we would do a set of drawings, then we would have a cost consultant look at it, and they would pr provide us a budget. In IPD, we have the estimators at the table and they're reviewing the decisions that we're making on a daily basis and, and we're evaluating. So we're able to design to the budget um, in a much more holistic way. So let's take a look at how this works. Say this block represents the total scope of a project. Uh, we're all familiar um, with the idea that we're gonna carve the project up into a variety of individual scope packages. Um, in a non-IPD world, when we try to optimize the project, the single entity conceptually responsible for each chunk looks at optimizing their part of the world, looking primarily through the lens of cost and schedule. In an IPD world, things look very different. We organize in small teams called project implementation teams or PITs. Each PIT is responsible for working to optimize its part of the project, looking at um, their work through the lens of not just cost and schedule, but um, a series of robustly defined goals and values set collectively by the team, and we'll talk about that. They dig deep and ask questions around a wide range of topics, working hard to find ways to drive value and innovation and waste out. And then um, we zoom out and we go up to 30,000 feet and take a holistic view of the project to see how things are going um, and for opportunities to find efficiencies between the pits. So the beauty of having this contractual boundary drawn around the perimeter of the project and not between individual areas of scope is that the team has the ability to move scope around in order to optimize outcomes. Ooh, what's going on here? I'll leave this up for a couple seconds. Okay, so let's look at a project. Um, in IPD, um, you can see that a project is about obviously the business objectives and the financial goals, but team culture is um, equal in importance to the owner goals and financial goals. Um, as an architect, um, you know, it's clear that many designers who've worked in, in the IPD environment report that it's richer and more invigorating than traditional practice and that the relationships and trust built between the designers and the contractors allow us to focus on creative aspects of their practice, which is so critical. And when we, when we come back to the St. Lawrence Center project, I think, I think this resonates so well that um, 
uh, you know, being able to, to really focus on the creativity and what that project means for the community um, is just incredible. And, and, and so from that sense, I think IPD is a really good choice for these complex projects. It's definitely not a spectator sport. Um, it involves lean thinking, which is about maximizing value, eliminating waste, and making reliable commitments. So many of the early work discussions on values, contracts, and roles serve a dual purpose. They help the team make those decisions and lay the foundation for a, a strong team culture. So it is about culture, and culture is a bit about behavior. Behavior is about common understanding. What is this guy talking about? Common understanding. It's about language, ultimately. Um, so we are human beings, we're biological and historical, and we live in language. We're creatures of habit, habits of mood, thought, and action. Language can help and harm, it can encourage and empower or discourage and undermine ideas and actions. And I think when I go through all these language slides, it's really interesting if you just put the, the St. Lawrence Center in the back of your head, um, because this is, this is where the benefit of this process can come to that project. Um, building operators, architects, engineers, and contractors speak different dialects, which sometimes vary within the same organization and often within the same discipline or trade. You need the right people in the room. Language has no power without people to hear the words. Uh, those are the project participants and stakeholders who speak to the value. And face-to-face -face conversations and workshops, as opposed to meetings for reporting progress, are the most effective. The telephone game is true. Um, reported conversations, especially by people outside the team, often lead to misunderstanding. So people use language to organize themselves for action. This is an essential first step. Language is progressive. Understanding comes from um, in layers, rarely at once. Conversations should be structured to work from um, big and simple to small and detailed based on understandings and agreements made at each step. You're probably wondering, I wasn't expecting an architect to be talking about language, but Let's, um, let's look at one of the, at one of the key principles of, um, of IPD. And usually what we see as a value is the idea of being accountable. But what does accountable mean? So if we look at it more holistically, to someone it could mean punctuality. To another, it could mean reliability. To another, it could mean responsible for actions. To yet another, it could mean doing what we say we are going to do. Ultimately, it, it is all of those things that is accountable. So we need to define what that means, especially if it's a value that is driving the project. So we can say we are accountable, we are punctual and reliable, we take responsibility for our actions and we do what we say we're going to do. And we call that a values alignment. And that's an actual process in IPD where everybody states what is important to them for project success. We then take all of that information and we bucket it into categories. And here's an example from one of our projects. Um, you can see that sustainability and longevity, longevity is a value and it's defined choice of systems, products, and processes that consider the life cycle of the building, healthy working, um, healthy working conditions, and environmental stewardship, flexible design, adaptable to growth and changing needs, um, uh, anticipate future technology. So there's a definition between behind each of these values. And they continue. So in this case, we had eight values for this project. Hopefully you can still see that. I can't see your screen anymore, though. Oh, I apologize. And we have about 15 minutes left. Yep. 
Perfect. I'm on slide 103 at 116, so we're good. <laughs> okay, so you should be able to see that now. I apologize. Um, so we evaluate our decisions through the lens of those values. So how can we then leverage um, IPD to build better buildings? It's about a culture that is framed by the value set for the project. Part of that is, you know, I talked about the traditional model where we ask a question that goes up over the fence to the other organization. Um, in IPD, we um, take co-location very seriously. Um, it's important to us that we are able to come together as a group. And uh, pre-pandemic, that was in person. Um, we have put a lot of systems to, in place um, through the pandemic where um, we are able to come together virtually and still have the same tools and processes in place. And we've, we've been able to make sure that that works successfully. Um, currently, as I'm speaking right now, we have what is called a big room happening virtually for our Canadian Community Museum project. Um, so, so while we had to pivot during the pandemic, we've been able to replicate this kind of coming together. And what we found now um, in 2020 is that a combination of in-person and virtual um, collaboration has been very successful um, for us and our teams. And um, so in these teams, we bring together the group, we set the values for which we make decisions. Um, so those values can be, um, as I showed earlier, they can be grouped into um, categories, but then those categories can be grouped into to major pieces such as um, what you see here, so behavior values behavioral values. And when we think about um, the work that you're doing with uh, the St. Lawrence Center, um, there's some really key things from this project that actually align, uh, align with that project. So you can see um, here the idea of keeping an open mind. Um, so we want to commit to a continuously improve the process by promoting free and safe environment where ideas can be shared at all times. When you're thinking about a groundbreaking project like the St. Lawrence Center, um, listening and being open is, uh, is, is so important. Um, given the sustainability targets that we've seen, um, and the fact that, uh, the, um, team wants to, um, uh, really create a project that is exemplary for this building type, um, you know, looking at flexibility, durability, life cycle, that's critical. We, in this case, we had um, a condition of satisfaction, which was sustainability. We're going to make responsible decisions um, for the local and global environment through design, construction, and the lifetime of the building. So if we go back to the St. Lawrence Center, what, uh, what they've said in their documentation is they're going to target Toronto Green Standards version three, tier four, and establish new um, sustainable performance standards for this archetype. It's really interesting. Um, I'm sure you've all done some research, but you know, uh, um, certain project types have, have lent themselves uh, more to sustainable practices than others. Um, a, uh, a theater, when you think about um, the type of space that it is and the cooling requirements during a performance and um, uh, how the mechanical systems have to react so differently at different times of day, um, this, this, this creates a really interesting opportunity, I think. Um, one of the things that I always say to our team is that with constraint comes opportunity and this archetype has a lot of constraint, but I think that that will drive um, Opportunity. So it's, uh, I think this piece here, establish new sustainable performance standards for this archetype, is just so awesome and brings such, um, such great thought, the potential for great thought to this project. So if we come back to the four goals, ensure dynamic and highly flexible spaces, build for extreme usability, create a bold and open building that fits the neighborhood and be future facing for a decarbonized world, fantastic. The other piece in the documentation um, is to uh, bring together a variety of partners, local artists and organizations, performers 
um, performers, educational partners, anchor tenants, and the local community in an open and accessible space. So for me, um, well, the design competition provides some opportunity for engagement. I honestly think that an IPD process would provide for much, much more um, engagement of the stakeholders, of the community. I think bringing the team together with the stakeholders could have so much value. And that's not to um, discredit any of the work that's been done to date. That is all the foundation for how the project moves forward and becomes successful in a design and construction phase. So I think you all have a really interesting project to look at um, through the boot camp. And with that, I'll take questions. Thanks, Bill. Um, students, you're welcome. Oh, they're coming up in the chat. Do you want me to read them to you, Bill? Sure. Okay. In an IPD project, how the general contractor and trades price the project without design documents, drawings, specifications. That's a great, that's a great, great question. Having, um, so the first piece is deciding who needs to be at the table and who should be part of the poly party agreement. So in the case of say the Canadian Key Museum project, we knew that we wanted a mass timber building. Um, we brought our mass timber trade partner on board um, as a partner early on. And, uh, and we started the design process right away. So um, from day one, um, design had begun and we knew what the functional program was for the project. So in fact, we are designing and budgeting as we go. So there's ways of talking about systems and what makes sense for systems, um, whether they're structural systems, mechanical systems, electrical systems. So those trade partners are providing value to help drive the design. Now, I, I'm gonna put a caveat in there because everybody will think of a more traditional model, which is design builds. But the reality is design needs to be the driver of the project. So um, I think we can achieve design excellence much better through an IPD process than we can through other processes. Because if, if design excellence is one of the values on which decisions are made, that is a defined value, as I showed in some of those slides, then that can really push um, the project forward from a design excellence standpoint. The same with sustainability. So decisions, early decisions can be made. So just even looking at how the building sits on the site and um, when we're looking at things like solar gain, et cetera, um, all of those early decisions can be made as a team and the team understands. I always love it on the Canadian Community Museum project, we have a, um, an electrical substrate who's never been involved in the early stages of the project. They just come in and they install the panels and they install the wiring and they install the lights. They have talked to so many groups about the value that they've seen in being involved in the early stages of a project. So, so at the early stages, the costing is just high level. It's like, if we go with this system, then we might be looking at this. And then we drive down through the validation project when we have a, when we have a design and we have specifications and we have um, the decisions around systems made. So um, I just wanted to, Brianne had a really great uh, point in her chat. Um, just Bill, as a former construction worker, I really, really enjoyed and appreciated your presentation. A lack of collaboration truly impacts a project negatively. And this IPD system seems like an incredible system, sensible solution. So, but Amkar has raised his hand. Did you could, want- Could I just comment on that just for yes, a second? Yes, yes. Because one of the things I didn't talk about was um, the fact that, um, uh, one of the things that we take really seriously on our projects as well is that the, the construction workers who have their feet on the ground day to day are also trained in IPD. So they understand the process that we've gone through. And one of the things that I so enjoy doing is actually going on site and doing sessions with those, um, with those various subtrade teams to talk about how we got to where we were at so that they have buy-in in the project. So, you know, if, if I'm a mason laying concrete block, I understand what drove this project. Go ahead, Amkar. Uh, thank you so much, Bill. It was a really nice session and 
uh, I would like to share something that I was a part of uh, general contractors who had integrated project delivery method. We had teams, but we didn't follow it successfully. So I know that it's a good thing, but unfortunately, if the leadership doesn't believe in it, then uh, there are downfalls. So uh, that brings me to the question, uh, like uh, like you mentioned right now in the last couple of slides, that uh, if they are following integrated project delivery method, a lot of architects or even contractors should be brought in at this phase of the project. But it seems right now that we are uh, doing the same stage again, right? We are first uh, hiring the architects and then we are going to go for the contractors. So like, uh, <laughs> does it fit in? That's, that's, that's right. Um, and, um, you know, I think the, the reality is that a design competition brings even more complexity. So it'll be interesting to see how it's run um, because what design competitions tend to do is, um, is, is highlight um, bold architecture more than anything else. So um, I truly think that um, an IPD approach would would align with the values of the organization better than a design competition, to be honest. That's my own personal opinion. Um, the other thing I'd just like to comment on, and, and thank you for bringing it up, Omkar, is that, um, you know, IPD is just ultimately a contractual model. If you do not buy into the cultural aspects of IPD, then um, it's easy for groups to, there's a Canadian contract that's available. It's a CCDC 30 contract. It's very easy for someone to enter into that contract and say, we're doing IPD. Well, they're not actually doing IPD. The, the, the cultural framework has to be the foundation. Okay, we have a 